Hi, and warm greetings to you. Here are the readings for day number 149. 1 Samuel 18 and 19, Psalm 102, and our first reading in Romans 7. In yesterday's story, David showed that he was more concerned with God's reputation than for his own safety. May we all face our imposing enemies with more belief in the unseen God than in the very present enemies. 1 Samuel 18 After David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them. For Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David, together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day, but Saul had a spear in his hand and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. Saul was then afraid of David, for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. Finally, Saul sent him away and appointed him commander over 1,000 men, and David faithfully led his troops into battle. David continued to succeed in everything he did, for the Lord was with him. When Saul recognized this, he became even more afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was so successful at leading his troops into battle. One day Saul said to David, I am ready to give you my older daughter Merab as your wife, but first you must prove yourself to be a real warrior by fighting the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, I'll send him out against the Philistines and let them kill him rather than doing it myself. Who am I and what is my family in Israel that I should be the king's son-in-law? David exclaimed. My father's family is nothing. So when the time came for Saul to give his daughter Merab in marriage to David, he gave her instead to Adriel, a man from Maholah. In the meantime, Saul's daughter, Michal, had fallen in love with David, and Saul was delighted when he heard about it. Here's another chance to see him killed by the Philistines, Saul said to himself. But to David he said, Today you have a second chance to become my son-in-law. Then Saul told his men to say to David, The king really likes you, and so do we. Why don't you accept the king's offer and become his son-in-law? When Saul's men said these things to David, he replied, How can a poor man from a humble family afford the bride price for the daughter of a king? When Saul's men reported this back to the king, he told them, Tell David that all I want for the bride price is one hundred Philistine foreskins. Vengeance on my enemies is all I really want. But what Saul had in mind was that David would be killed in the fight. David was delighted to accept the offer. Before the time limit expired, he and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. Then David fulfilled the king's requirement by presenting all their foreskins to him. So Saul gave his daughter Michal to David to be his wife. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and how much his daughter Michal loved him, 
Saul became even more afraid of him, and he remained David's enemy for the rest of his life. Every time the commanders of the Philistines attacked, David was more successful against them than all the rest of Saul's officers, so David's name became very famous. 1 Samuel 19 Saul now urged his servants and his son Jonathan to assassinate David, but Jonathan, because of his strong affection for David, told him what his father was planning. Tomorrow morning, he warned him, you must find a hiding place out in the fields. I'll ask my father to go out there with me, and I'll talk to him about you. Then I'll tell you everything I can find out. The next morning, Jonathan spoke with his father about David, saying many good things about him. The king must not sin against his servant David, Jonathan said. He's never done anything to harm you. He has always helped you in any way he could. Have you forgotten about the time he risked his life to kill the Philistine giant and how the Lord brought a great victory to all Israel as a result? You were certainly happy about it then. Why should you murder an innocent man like David? There's no reason for it at all. So Saul listened to Jonathan and vowed, As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be killed. Afterward, Jonathan called David and told him what had happened. Then he brought David to Saul, and David served in the court as before. War broke out again after that, and David led his troops against the Philistines. He attacked them with such fury that they all ran away. One day, when Saul was sitting at home with spear in hand, the tormenting spirit from the Lord suddenly came upon him again. As David played his harp, Saul hurled his spear at David, but David dodged out of the way, leaving the spear stuck in the wall. He fled and escaped into the night. Then Saul sent troops to watch David's house. They were told to kill David when he came out the next morning, but Michal, David's wife, warned him, If you don't escape tonight, you will be dead by morning. So she helped him climb out through a window, and he fled and escaped. Then she took an idol and put it in his bed, covered it with blankets, and put a cushion of goat's hair at its head. When the troops came to arrest David, she told them he was sick and couldn't get out of bed. But Saul sent the troops back to get David. He ordered them, Bring him to me in his bed so I can kill him. But when they came to carry David out, they discovered that it was only an idol in the bed with a cushion of goat's hair at its head. Why have you betrayed me like this and let my enemy escape? Saul demanded of Michal. I had to. He threatened to kill me if I didn't help him. So David escaped and went to Ramah to see Samuel, and he told him all that Saul had done to him. Then Samuel took David with him to live at Naioth. When the report reached Saul that David was at Naioth in Ramah, he sent troops to capture him. But when they arrived and saw Samuel leading a group of prophets who were prophesying, the Spirit of God came upon Saul's men, and they also began to prophesy. When Saul heard what had happened, he sent other troops, but they too prophesied. The same thing happened a third time. Finally, Saul himself went to Ramah and arrived at the great well at Seku. Where are Samuel and David, he demanded. They are at Naioth in Ramah, someone told him. But on the way to Naioth in Ramah, the Spirit of God came even upon Saul, and he too began to prophesy all the way to Naioth. He tore off his clothes and lay naked on the ground all day and all night, prophesying in the presence of Samuel. The people who were watching exclaimed, What? Is even Saul a prophet? This psalm starts out like the prayer of anyone in distress and trouble, calling out to God. As we read further, many see parallels with what our Savior would have prayed in his darkest days on earth. Psalm 102 A prayer of one overwhelmed with trouble, pouring out problems before the Lord. O Lord, listen to my prayer. Listen to my plea. 
Don't turn away from me in my time of distress. Bend down to listen and answer me quickly when I call to you. For my days disappear like smoke and my bones burn like red-hot coals. My heart is sick, withered like grass, and I have lost my appetite. Because of my groaning, I am reduced to skin and bones. I'm like an owl in the desert, like a little owl in a far-off wilderness. I lie awake, lonely as a solitary bird on a roof. My enemies taunt me day after day. They mock and curse me. I eat ashes for food. My tears run down into my drink because of your anger and wrath. For you have picked me up and thrown me out. My life passes as swiftly as the evening shadows. I am withering away like grass. But you, O oh Lord, will sit on your throne forever. Your fame will endure to every generation. You will arise and have mercy on Jerusalem. And now is the time to pity her. Now is the time you promise to help. For your people love every stone in her walls and cherish even the dust in her streets. Then the nations will tremble before you, Lord. The kings of the earth will tremble before your glory. For you, Lord, will rebuild Jerusalem. You will appear in your glory. You will listen to the prayers of the destitute. You will not reject their pleas. This is to be recorded for future generations, so that a people not yet born will praise the Lord. Tell them the Lord looked down from his heavenly sanctuary. He looked down to earth from heaven to hear the groans of the prisoners, to release those condemned to die. And so the Lord's fame will be celebrated in Zion. His praises in Jerusalem when multitudes gather together and kingdoms come to worship the Lord. He broke my strength in midlife, cutting short my days. But I cried to him, O oh God, my God, who lives forever, don't take my life while I am so young. Long ago you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will change them like a garment and discard them. But you are always the same. You will live forever. The children of your people will live in security. Their children's children will thrive in your presence. The last verse of yesterday's reading, the one about wages, shows why it is better to take what we are given rather than what we have earned. This is a big problem for some. My dad's having lived a good life, was one of the biggest blocks to him humbly coming to God and receiving the gift of eternal life. I don't think he ever understood how God would not be so impressed by his supposed good life. The spiritual reality expressed starting at the beginning of the sixth chapter of Romans is a key to place along with a second key that we will hear about in today's chapter. Romans 7 Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, 
Don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ, and now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds, resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time I lived without understanding the law, but when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law, which was good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing the wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Oh, what a miserable person I am! Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God! 
the answer is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The passage that we have just read is one of the most difficult to interpret. Does Paul mean here that everything that he said about our being released from the bondage of sin and death wasn't true? I don't think so. I think that starting with about verse 7, he's talking about his life before he knew Christ or the life of someone who forgets about Christ. He hasn't mentioned Christ and our living in him since uh, since verse 6. This is talking about how he struggled with sin apart from Christ or forgetting the key that was mentioned before the spiritual reality of our death and dying with Christ and the role of the Holy Spirit. That's how I take it. And I know that others of the readers will take it differently. One thing I'm certain, I don't believe Paul would have been giving permission for people who use this as an excuse for sin, for persistent and uncontrolled sin. Now let's pray together. O Lord our God, it certainly is true that we too often revert to the way we were before, and we struggle in our flesh to try to live a good life in your eyes, and we fail miserably because the good that we want to do, we don't do. We do the things that we don't want to do when we live that way. But not only can we remember that we are joined to Christ, but we have your Spirit with us. Now we can serve God not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. O Lord, teach us what that means, because there is the power. So we thank you, Lord, for the power of the Spirit in our lives. May we live in step with your Spirit. We pray this for the glory of Christ Jesus. Amen.